Hey everyone, it's uh, 1230. We're going to go ahead and uh, get rolling. We have a uh, excellent line of panelists um, who are going to be sharing with us on some great federal social media uh, for the next couple hours. We have a pretty tight session. We have a lot of really great presenters. Um, so go ahead and for this session, for this whole virtual session, if you have a question at any point, you can go ahead and direct that to the chat box and, you know, hopefully we'll have some time to get to everyone's questions. If we don't, I've asked the presenters to give out their email addresses so they can follow up. So, uh, you can follow up with them, um, after this session is over and you can always connect through the listserv as well. Um, just a reminder that we are recording this session. Um, so if you need to pop out or miss anything, don't worry, you can catch up to it later and we'll send out the link to that. Uh, when it's ready. Um, you can also share that around your offices with all your other uh, colleagues and encourage them to uh, sign up for the listserv uh, for social gov. So I'm uh, Gabrielle Prey. I am the senior media advisor for GSA and I am lead on social gov, which is uh, this group. This is the federal government's community of practice. Um, thank you guys for joining us today for our all virtual session, our quarterly virtual session. Um, it would have been nice to have this in person, but unfortunately we're just rolling with this telework environment. I know that uh, we're what's uh, week seven, week eight, and it's hard to even keep track now. So I know we're all feeling a little bit uh, kind of worn out from the virtual environment, but it's you know so refreshing to see everybody you know following along on federal social media, just seeing folks like you know, really keeping it rolling. It's uh, no disruptions to it. It's like incredible to see colleagues across the federal workforce right now, just like really stepping up to keep, you know, business going for the government um, and in particular social media. I know we're going to hear from the folks at Interior Fish and Wildlife Service National Park Service today on their social accounts. If you follow them, they're just incredibly uplifting and inspiring and really a bright spot, I think, in uh, everyone's day, especially me in particular, like I really enjoy their accounts. Um, we're also going to be hearing just for a few minutes up front, Matt Harmon from DHS. He's going to be talking to us about the guidelines for opening up America again. He's going to give us a little update. Um, our friends, Asha and Katie from, uh, the uh, Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs are going to give us some tips on crisis communications for social media. We're going to be hearing from James Robert on an update on census 2020 social media and how federal agencies can help out census uh, right now. Um, I'm going to be talking for a few minutes about how I run my internal community of practice at GSA. We have over 100 social media, different satellites accounts, and you know how this has been critical for us in COVID-19 times and crisis communications to get everybody on the same page. Um, and it's been instrumental, I think, for us uh, to keep everybody on brand and message. Uh, so I'll be talking for a few minutes, um, and then we also have uh, Layla and Carolina from. The State uh, Department of State Foreign Service Institute. They're going to be talking about finding an appropriate tone on social media in a crisis. Um, so, just another reminder again: if everybody can keep uh, their computers on mute and turn off your cameras if you're not presenting, that just helps us to save a little bandwidth, and I think it makes the um, camera feed a little less choppy. We had over 400 people actually registered today. It looks like we're um, nearing up, pushing up to 200 folks who are already joining us today. That's wonderful. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and tag in Matt Harvin. I see him right there. If you want to jump on Matt and give us an update. Hey, how's everybody doing today? Um, so my name is Matt Harmon, I'm the uh, uh, director of public web over at the Department of Homeland Security, and I'm also the, uh, the co-chair for the Federal Web Council. And I wanted to take an opportunity to join your group and um, Hopefully, you all have been getting the uh, the guidance emails that I've been sending out around coronavirus and, and all of that stuff. And um, if you haven't, I just wanted to point out that you can go to digital.gov slash coronavirus and uh, the, the guidance that we've been issuing uh, from, from the get-go of all of this is, uh, is, is all being posted there. The um, most recently, I sent out a message yesterday um, because the White House Coronavirus Task Force asked us to uh, to promote the uh, the new guidelines for opening up America, and um, so that information was 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 sent out via email. It'll be up on digital.gov very shortly today, and um, it's it's pretty simple. The gave the URL is whitehouse.gov/openingamerica. Uh, we gave uh, an image that people can use if you'd like to, to use that. Otherwise, you can uh, I attach it to the email. If it didn't come through on the email, um, I, I gave a uh, gave a URL that you can download it from from the White House directly. 
Um, but I also wanted to take an opportunity to, to reiterate um, and thank everybody for staying in their lane on this and then linking to the, the, to the required links and promoting the rely, required links um, uh, pretty much from the get-go of all of this stuff. It's, it's really been, a, uh, it's really been a, a great effort government-wide, um, and it's, um, hey, I just saw Ken Bradley show up. I haven't seen Ken in a while. Hi, Ken. How you doing? Um, <laughs> Um, no, this has been this has been a really uh, this has been a really neat effort in terms of getting the entire uh, federal web and social um, uh, workforce and all of our various sites and channels and everything else all pointing in one direction, which is really an amazing thing that we we can do every once in a while. So uh, it is helping. We appreciate it much like uh, the social distancing and everything else. It works best if everybody does it and you've been doing it. So yay. Um, and if you guys have any questions, please reach out and let me know. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, it looks like Alex from Digital Gov Team chatted out that link if you guys need that. I also pushed that out to the Social Gov uh, listserv yesterday. So you're welcome. If you need anything, follow up with Matt uh, directly um, or shoot Digital Gov or myself an email. We'll, uh, we'll point you to who you need to get to. So thanks so much. Appreciate it. Um, I was going to say it's either, uh -huh. either myself yep. or Stacy Pulaski, myself or Stacy Pulaski at HHS, and the, that contact information is um, is uh, provided. And basically, if you've got anything that needs to go up to the White House, um, we're we're trying to be a clearinghouse uh, as much as possible for them because they're getting slammed by a thousand different ways. So if yeah. you've got something, yeah. um, you know, feeding it to to Joanne for USA.gov, uh, they're post doing a great job of curating and posting information there and. The larger stuff we're feeding up to the um, and trying to coordinate and um, consolidate for the White House guys so they can make uh, easy, quick decisions. So that's great. And uh, USA uh, Gov team is a, a GSA office. They've been doing amazing. I work with them. You know, hey Claire, Leilani, Ed, you guys. I'm sure you guys are on the call. Um, and they have that great resource page. If you guys haven't seen it, GSA's been tweeting on it a bunch. Um, it's the USA.gov backslash coronavirus, and that lists all the government wide efforts. Um, to defeat COVID-19. So thanks so much, Matt. Really appreciate the update. Thanks for uh, chiming in on short notice. I know we're all happy to hear from you. Thanks um, for inviting me. Sure. Yep, thanks so much. Okay, next up, I have uh, our friends Asha and Katie from Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. They're gonna be talking to us about some crisis communications tips for social media. And again, if you guys have any questions, uh, go ahead and send them right to the chat box and I hope that we'll be able to get to them. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I hope you're all doing well today. I'm going to be talking to you about social media during coronavirus times. My name is Asha Bay. I'm the Alumni Outreach Specialist in the Office of Alumni Affairs in the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the US Department of State. You can remember me as Asha Bay from ECA. My main role is managing our digital strategy and sharing information about the resources and opportunities we offer to participants of US government exchange programs, also known as our exchange alumni. Today, I'll be discussing the importance of keeping the lights on, understanding your audience now versus pre-COVID-19, and trying new things. I'll also share how our office is doing those things as we reach out to exchange alumni in the US and internationally. To give you a little background about me, I started out in journalism as a print reporter and then spent several years as a producer in broadcast and online news for NPR, Bloomberg Business News, CNN, CNBC, and NBC. I also did a social media stint for the Veterans Health Administration in 2008. And in 2010, I made the leap to managing social media and digital content full-time for state, starting at the U.S. Consulate in Chennai. I've had to deal with a few crises along the way, including 9-11 and years later, an attack on the consulate in Chennai. It was horrible being in the CNBC newsroom, watching the towers fall. And it was also scary having to evacuate the consulate to get out of harm's way. But the coronavirus is unlike anything I, and probably most of us, have ever dealt with in our lives. 
It's novel in a lot of ways, from the sheer impact it's had on our everyday lives, the economy, global health, and more. Worse, we can't hug any of our family or friends to feel better. And while it's tempting to run and hide under the covers until it's all over, it's more important than ever to keep the lights on our social media and digital platforms. With the coronavirus, we're not just facing a global health pandemic, we're facing an infodemic of misinformation that can also harm us. By keeping our social media properties running, we can help, we can use them to help debunk and dispel misinformation. We can also give some light and hope to those who need it. According to a report by Global Web Index, over 80% of consumers in the US and the UK say they are consuming more content since the outbreak, with broadcast TV and online videos being the primary mediums across all generations and genders. And 68% of consumers are seeking out pandemic updates online over any other activity. Where are the different generations turning to for information right after the WHO website, government platforms, and government emails and newsletters? This data may not be true the world over, but for places where it is valid, we have an opportunity to share accurate information on our social media platforms and through our emails and newsletters. In other words, even if we're not posting rah-rah stories like we used to, we can still play, play a role in keeping our audiences informed. MailChimp, anyone? As social media practitioners, we are constantly monitoring our audiences. We know their ages, their check gender, their country, etc. But what's going on now? This is an opportunity to take another look at your audience and who's following you. Have your demographics changed as more people have flocked to Facebook? It's also a good time to put yourself in their shoes. What's going on with your top fans and followers? How are they holding up these days? How are they handling social distancing and quarantine? Have they lost their job or are they struggling with being home alone? Then step back and look at the big picture. How can you adjust your messaging to take into account what your audience is dealing with? Are there new or different ways to engage your audience? Our Bureau at State handles exchange programs, including the Fulbright Program, the International Visitor Leadership Program, the Congress Bundestag Youth Exchange, the National Security Language Initiative for Youth, and hundreds more. Every exchange program participant who completes their program becomes part of the exchange alumni family. And these alumni are our audience. We've got young alumni, older alumni, alumni who work in global health, alumni who are world leaders, musicians, educators, artists, athletes, etc. Prior to the COVID-19 shutdown, we ran campaigns on different policy initiatives like entrepreneurship and media literacy. We created Motivational Monday and Travel Tuesday posts and other holidays. We shared info on our grant opportunities and ran a monthly Facebook Live program called Mentor Talks. When COVID-19 hit, we followed protocol and stuck to official messages. Then when the good news stories started trickling in, stories about what alumni were doing to flatten the curve, we slowly started sharing them on social media. We wondered, should we go ahead with our monthly Mentor Talks show? And we did, and our audience loved it. This screenshot is from our March 31st episode on the impact of storytelling. Fulbright alumnus and Zuckerberg Institute co-founder Michael Liddick was our guest. And his show is our most viewed Mentor Talks episode this year. And actually of all our Mentor Talks shows, it's the most viewed. We also found that our audience really likes video. No brainer, right? But for our audience, the video doesn't have to be live or even embedded on our page. Like this post, it features Dr. Jamie Morano, a Fulbright alumna and doctor who's on the front lines of COVID-19. A link in the post goes to her video in which Dr. Morano explains the coronavirus and answers common questions about it. Since we've been in lockdown, it's been our most popular post to date, even more popular than Michael's mentor talks.
Similarly, we did a post about goal setting in times of disruption, which was a link to a Zoom event led by an award-winning exchange alumnus named Raj. It was also popular, and we only posted it less than two hours before the event started. Our audience has always loved funding opportunities. This post on an emergency grant for journalists from National Geographic proved that our alumni fans still want informed grants, and even more so now. On Twitter, we also saw some changes. Pre-coronavirus, tweets about our live events did well, but they weren't always the top tweet. Now they are. And those good news stories I mentioned earlier, on Twitter, our audience is happy to hear what Exchange alumni are doing to flatten the curve. We really can't tweet, way to go, thank you, and keep up the good work and up. With each tweet, we reach more people and see more engagement than we did before. Why not us? Why not now? So, ladies and gentlemen, this is your fault, and this is SGN. We could stick with what's working and leave it at that. But like John Krasinski, we decided to try something new. It can be scary to try something new, especially in these uncertain times. But we don't know how long this is going to last, so why not make the most of it? First, we created a COVID-19 good news page. We launched it two weeks ago on April 15th, and it's currently one of the top 20 pages for our site. This is a place where we share links to official information from the CDC, including FEMA's rumor control page. And we also share all those good news stories we keep hearing about, or the ones that I keep telling you about. And we're also using this page to promote another initiative that we're working on with LinkedIn, which is to expand our engagement with Exchange alumni on LinkedIn and also connect them better there. And what we did on LinkedIn was we set up a showcase page and also highlighted ways for Exchange alumni to connect with each other. We have over 100 new followers, and our most popular post is this one, featuring ECA Assistant Secretary Marie Royce's welcome message. Smart master, he made me this color so that I may talk, squirrel. To wrap up, there's a lot of uncertainty we're dealing with now. When will the lockdown be over? When will we be able to go back to our regular lives? We're not sure. Every day brings something new. It's unsettling. We can, however, focus on what we do know. Like, we know people are looking for ways to connect and be social. We know that sometimes squirrels or distractions help, help people feel better. We know that things will change at some point. And we know that our, our social media platforms can help us stay connected to our audience and help them connect with each other, which creates opportunities for us and them now and in the future. So keep the lights on, understand your audience now versus before coronavid or coronavirus, try new things or not, do what works for your agency and audience. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions now, or you can email me, ashabay at eca at bayac at state.gov. And now over to Katie Stesa, who handles social media for ECA's Education USA program. So, hello everyone. My name is Katie Stesa. I actually work at the Institute of International Education. We are the cooperating partner um, with ECA. I work on the Education USA program and I manage 10 social media accounts for Education USA. So things are very busy always. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about some of the tips and best practices that I share with our network um, about social media marketing during tumultuous time. So whenever I have, um, well, let me just back up and give a little bit of context about Education USA. Education USA um, promotes U.S. higher education to international students. 
we offer free services to students. We have offices in over 180 countries, over 420 advising centers um, where students can, you know, reach out to advisors virtually now and get information about studying in the US. So anytime I start this presentation, I always like to talk about our brand. And I think it's so important, especially during this time that all of us keep our brand and what it stands for at the forefront of our mind. Um, brand consistency is part of building trust. And when you're placing your educational future in someone else's hands, it's really scary. So that's why presenting Education USA as a reputable, trustworthy brand is vital. So to do that, um, we create a newsletter that is sent out every week. It is called Social Media Digest. We include five posts in there for Monday through Friday, a Facebook post, Twitter post, Instagram, and then some accompanying graphics for it. Um, we, two of the graphics are in English language. Two of the graphics have no text on them. So advisors are able to download them and put them into local language if they wish. We also include a few Instagram stories. Um, a few of our favorites have been talking about different majors that are offered in the US and also we have a word of the day. Um, and so I always tell my advisors that it can feel very strange showing up on social media um, during a global pandemic. I mean, people are going through extreme anxiety and devastation, illness, but amid all of this chaos, we still need to run. And that takes awareness and attention from all social media marketers. So I always tell them, even though you receive the social media digest every Friday, practice social listening. If something doesn't feel right for your audience or your advisors, don't post it. It's better to not post than to post something offensive. Also in Social Media Digest, um, we include a list of COVID-19 content where um, you're able to click on these hyperlinks. It will take you to um, verified pages that you can easily repost stuff from. We also curate content. So many places right now are offering um, free resources for people affected by COVID. So we always include those resources for our advisors to share with their students. Additionally, um, with every single graphic that I create in Canva, I remove the text and then upload it to a shared box folder for our entire network to have access to. So it's graphics that are in our branded colors and have our logo that they're easily able to go in there, download and put in, um, you know, whatever they have going on, whether that be a virtual webinar or a training institute or whatever they want to publicize. Um, and as Asha had mentioned in her presentation, social media um, is more important than ever. As people around the world are adjusting to this new normal, we're scrambling to pivot campaigns, adjust content calendars, and come up with new creative ideas to market our services. Um, and staying connected is now more important than ever with people and businesses relying on social media to stay in touch with friends, consume the news, and be entertained. So according to this one survey, Facebook and Instagram saw a 40% increase in usage due to COVID-19 and views for Instagram Live and Facebook Live doubled in one week. So just because people are spending more time on social media doesn't mean it's business as usual. Um, and we cannot afford to stop marketing. That includes posting on social media. Uh, but it's important to remember that this is brand new territory for all marketers. No one is an expert on how to market on social media through a global pandemic. Um, so while I don't like to offer tried and true strategies, or while I can't offer tried and true strategies, I offer a few um, thinking points um, for you to reflect on before posting on social media. And then before I jump into that, I do want to mention our hashtag. We have a hashtag that we created. It is hashtag EdUSA at home. Um, all of our posts have included that. All of the posts that advisors have been doing in their country have included that. And I will show you some of the results from the campaign. Um, so on March 19th, this is when we started the campaign. 
as of April 21st, over 2,600 social media posts were tagged with it. Um, we have been asking advisors around the world to hold up signs that say hashtag EdUSA at home. It's been really neat to see how creative they're getting. We've gotten our students to hold up signs. Um, so if this is something that's possible for your agency, I urge you to create a hashtag for whatever that might be, include like at home and invite people to share their pictures with you because we all know that user generated content is gold. So here are some of the reflection points before social or uh, sharing stuff on social media that I like to think about. Um, listen and acknowledge. Ignoring COVID-19 or pretending like everything is normal can come across as very tone deaf. So simply just acknowledging the current climate really does make a difference in humanizing your brand. And then in addition to that, it's important to know your brand and keep posting. So don't do what other people are doing and copy that. Understand the role that your organization plays in people's lives. How has that changed? And then how can you help be useful during that crisis? You don't have to mention COVID-19 explicitly in all of your content. Um, do take into consideration the tone of your captions and how it could be interpreted by people facing a reality different from yours. Um, acknowledge that right now is kind of a weird time to be promoting international education. And also acknowledge that not everyone is in a position to plan for college overseas right now. It shows that you're being empathetic and you're thinking about all of your followers, not just the ones that who can afford to study in the US. Make sure that you're providing authentic value. Um, you know, address social distancing. How is your team stepping up and doing your part during this time? And then also be a source of information. This ties back into, you know, what our brand stands for. We're trustworthy, we're comprehensive, we're sharing updates all the time about, you know, the ACT test got moved or the SAT was changed. Um, be a source of information for your followers. And then these are just some basic social media ideas that I share with our advisors. Um, let people in behind the scenes. So what does a day in the life of an Education USA advisor look like right now? Or what does your work life look like right now? Educate on what you do, what motivates you to do it, what you're passionate about. Why do you love the US higher education system? Make, create some feel good posts. Um, now is a great time to refine and hone your skills and take trainings. Canva offers free design classes, um, which I encourage everyone to take. They're very quick and easy. Revisit old content that can still serve your audience. Um, you can get double the engagement on posts that performed well in the past. Also, right now is a great time to refresh your online presence. Do you have the proper keywords in there to help your SEO? Um, do all of your links work? Is everything up to date? Also, boost your visibility with more live videos. Although, do that strategically since what I found, and I'm sure you have as well, is everyone is trying to go live right now since seems like the new hot thing to do, but if everyone is going live, then it's not as special. So think through your live video strategy before hopping on. I also encourage you to try out some challenges. Um, this or that is very popular, especially with college age students or pre-college age students. Um, sometimes we do like a thankful Friday, we'll have them list five things that they're thankful for and tag Ed USA. This in turn gets the students to post this onto their social media platform and helps us expand our reach. Also, um, well, going back to our hashtag at USA at home, uh, it's really great that now we have over 2000 posts because if I'm looking for content or want to get inspired, I can just search that hashtag on Instagram and see what people around the world are doing and sort of take from different education usa centers and find some really good user generated content that way um, hashtags are also just really great especially for twitter and instagram um, these are some of our favorites monday motivation 
Throwback Thursday is really good for um, some of that content that you can revisit and repost. Um, so Spotlight Sunday, um, we find that one very popular. We uh, showcase a different advisor every Sunday at the same time. It gives our followers something to look forward to. Um, but there is a rhyme and reason to a great hashtag, make it memorable, keep it short and sweet, do your research, don't overcomplicate it. Um, and try to get at least nine of them in an Instagram post. That's the sweet spot. Um, all right. And then something else that we are doing is in our social media digest, we are collecting best practices all the time from advisors. Um, we're very big in this group mentality at Education USA. And even though we're spread out across the entire world, uh, we like to know what everyone is doing and learn from one another. So that is um, my social media presentation that I share with the Education USA Network and now with you all. My email address is up on the screen and I'm happy to chat further about any of these ideas. Um, so uh, I'm going to just talk for a few minutes about our little community of practice um, that we have a GSA. Um, I lead that we have about a uh, hundred ish accounts and uh, run by 140 ish uh, different people all across the agency. And there's a very uh, uh, diverse experience among the people who run these accounts. Some people do social media professionally. Um, some people inherited these accounts and have never done the, the Twitter before. So uh, we have a very diverse group at GSA and we're very supportive and um, we wanna engage all of the users to get all of our social media great. Uh, when I came into my role about two years ago, uh, we, uh, to the Office of Strategic Communications, um, you know, it was a little bit of a question for us, uh, you know, um, what accounts did we have out there and, um, you know, who was running them? So, uh, you know, it was kind of a big mystery. Um, and if we have any folks from NARA on the line right now, you may be thinking like, oh, hey, this is all sounding familiar. Uh, I touched base with the social team at NARA and you know, they were so kind to talk me through how they manage all their accounts. They also have hundreds of different social media accounts across all the different platforms. Um, so they were very kind to give me an overview of their community of, of practice, which inspired ours at GSA. Um, so some of the issues that we had, um, you know, before we did this that we were trying to solve is, you know, we didn't know what accounts were out there. Uh, we didn't know, um, you know, folks didn't know what the process was to start up a new account. So people in the agency would just start a new account and they were surprised to learn there was an approval process for that. So uh, that was kind of a concern for us. Um, some of our accounts were posting things that are off brand. They aren't mission focused. They're using silly wacky gifts that kind of didn't fit with content or GSA really our brand. Um, some of them weren't following our agency policy, you know, there were some issues uh, getting everybody, um, you know, on the same page. And, uh, you know, my, my concern too always was if we had a, a crisis situation, um, implementing our crisis comms process would be difficult if we didn't know all the accounts out there and we didn't know who was actually the POC on all of them. Um, um, so real quick, how we put our community of practice together. Um, I think the first step was really determining where the buck stops on social media we, uh, for GSA. That was the Office of Strategic Communications. We issue our agency policy on social media and we approve all social media channels. Um, so, for, uh, for, so for us, for GSA, it was appropriate um, for OSC, that's my team, to um, you know, start this group and we are the sponsor of our community of practice and I am the lead on that. I, um, if you don't know me already. Um, I manage also the five flagship social media accounts for GSA um, on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, my second step on this was to conduct a social media audit. I pulled all of our numbers. I did manual searches through all the different platforms. I reached out to different program offices and I put together a big list. And I also, um, I'll plug the digital registry on here too, if you guys haven't already updated um, your accounts for your agency, you know, please take five minutes and go in and if you don't know what that is, reach out to me. I'm happy to put you in contact with the folks at DigitalGov um, that can help you get your account set up on the digital registry. So that's a good place to start as well, to start identifying what accounts are out there and to get POCs um, for each of them. And I uh, 
So I started a community of practice. We meet once a month at GSA. Um, we have a virtual, it's, you know, we do like a hangouts where we have like, it's all virtual. Um, but I usually not now because of COVID-19, but we have, um, usually a in-person room that people can come and like meet and greet if they're actually in the building. Um, that day, so we meet once a month and the topics I usually discuss, I go over like the big flagship wins. I talk about our metrics and analytics, um, mostly to socialize that there's a lot of number. We had some folks who started um, in the community of practice, not even knowing that Twitter had analytics. So this was like big news and they were really excited to learn that they had some measure of knowing if their content was successful or not. Um, so we go, we talk about analytics a lot. I talk about content creation and talk about graphic design. Um, I usually tag in different folks on the accounts, uh, you know, who manage different accounts to talk about things that are they're having issues with or concerns or problems. Um, we also have our wonderful um, attorney, uh, Jessica Hawkins. I'm not sure if she joined today or not, but uh, we have usually our attorney sits in uh, for the meeting and it's like an open forum. If you have a question to ask, uh, you know, it's a very open um, learning environment. So people are welcome to if, you know, ask her any pressing questions that they have off the top of their heads. Um, and I think the key to running a community of practice is to have somebody who is the point person and somebody who owns this. So I set up all the meetings every month. I set our agenda. It's like, I have, you know, I'm, I am the lead. Somebody really needs to be the lead, I think, to make that successful. Um, and the other thing that really makes our group uh, run well is having a listserv. Um, GSA sponsors a lot of different listservs. They sponsor this listserv, the social gov listserv. Um, so in a crisis, uh, you know, or even day to day, it's like very easy to push out a message to all of our accounts. Um, it's just as easy as typing in our email address um, to get a, a, an email out uh, to the whole group. And for, I have to say, like for this COVID-19 situation, like the day that we were all sent home and we're all kind of it was so unfamiliar and it was so uncertain and we all really want to do the right thing and we all want to have the right message. And um, in this environment, you know, like GSA, like I'm sure a lot of agencies, like we paused, we don't want to be tweeting out the wrong content. And so we really paused and we focused for about a week or so to um, just focus on amplifying authoritative COVID-19 content. So we were focused on like retweeting CDC, HHS, FEMA, um, you know, FTC, IRS, like anybody who had authoritative content on COVID-19, that was our focus at the time was getting that out to our audience. Um, and we kind of, you know, I was able to message out to every single POC on our, uh, you know, in our internal community, um, you know, hey, everybody stop for a second and um, everybody snap too. Like it was incredible to see a whole team, a diverse team of people who work all across the agency, across all different programs, like everybody stopped and everybody was on the same page. Like this was really cool to do. Um, and for, you know, the first few weeks, it's like, I was feel, you know, everybody was, uh, yeah, I was kind of an open POC for this. Like, you know, ask me anything. If you have any content, you need a second set of eyes on. If you want to run something, it's like, ping it to me. I'm available to do a gut check. You know, if you have COVID-19, we had some specific COVID-19 content. Like I, I will run that for you as fast as humanly possible to get that out. And it was incredible to see a response I was getting. I was just so impressed with the GSA team, you know, across the whole agency that, you know, people were really on the same page. Like it was great. So I think, you know, we do the Eagle Horizon exercise every year. That's the, an, the annual continuity exercise for the whole federal government. And last year um, we had done the exercise of, you know, if there was a big natural disaster, I forget what the exercise was exactly, but there was a big disaster and we have to implement our crisis comms plan. And part of that was getting social media all on the same page. And so this year in a real life scenario of COVID-19 pandemic, it's like we snapped that and we were all together at once. And like everybody, and you know, it was important for them to know, like, they know me personally, they get emails from me all the time. Um, we're having them, people know, like, who is the POC to get something cleared? That was me. And I try to do things as fast as I possibly can and be responsive to everyone. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it was great. I encourage you if you haven't, here's my other site. Yeah, this really gets our, got our account. I'm really speaking mostly for the COVID-19 environment. This was in incredible to have everybody, you know, on the same page. Um, but this really over the last, uh, it's been like a year and a half since we've done this. Um, it's gotten all of our accounts uh, posting on brand. Like they all look professional. There's no, no more wacky gifts or like crazy emojis or like 
there was one account we had that kind of tweeted like it always reminded me of like spam marketing emails and now it's like everybody's so professional i love it and um yeah all of our accounts kind of have a feel and they know and they're they look very professional um and like i was saying the all of our account rules know where they can turn when they have questions if they need something run through through our Office of Strategic Communications, like I'm that person, they know to email me or chat me or call me like whenever they have something. Um, and this really helped to, to socialize our agency policy on media and social media too. Like people understand when they can tweet something, what is an endorsement, for example? I, I think that was kind of a new concept to a lot of folks. You know, when, who, when they can tag people, like what types of accounts they can tag. And so I think like socializing our policy, and then importantly, if you want to create a new account, like what is the process for that? Socializing that um, has been terrific. That, that's been a big benefit. Um, and it's connected people in the group across all of our business lines. So some folks may not have known each other because somebody works in real estate. GSA does a ton of different things, but somebody may have worked in real estate and somebody may have worked in acquisition. So these folks, maybe their paths haven't crossed before, but since they both run social media accounts, it's like, I think it forms really nice relationships across our business lines. Um, and like I was talking about, it made our, made our crisis communications measures like happen in a second. Like it was really easy to push the button and make that happen. Um, so if you have any questions for me, like I'm happy to always chat more about, um, you know, our little group, uh, you know, how we, how we run and how I keep our meetings going um, every month. Or if you ever want to sit in a one, you probably can. I think that'd be fine. You can shoot me an email here and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about it. Wonderful. Well, hello, and thank you for having us today. We're going to be talking about using humor and beauty to connect to your community. And I'm Danielle Brigida. I work with the Department of the Interior. And I'm here with... Hey, I'm Mahali Richards. I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service based out of Honolulu. Hey, I'm Matt Turner. I'm a social media specialist with the National Park Service. I uh, work in the Office of Communications in Washington. Wonderful. Well, we're really excited to be here. And thanks for humoring me and letting me just throw that to you. <laughs> um, so we, we all work in different bureaus, but um, for the US Department of the Interior. And if you aren't familiar with our mission, we manage America's vast natural and cultural resources. Uh, there are a number of bureaus that work within the interior like the National Park Service and the US Fish and Wildlife Service, but we also have USGS and, and the Bureau of Land Management. And so we represent a lot of different mindsets and, and work across the country. Um, but we all share in a similar goal for our social media, and it's to engage, educate, and be a direct connection for people. Largely so they care about how we're spending their tax dollars, but also so they're engaged with our mission. And social media is a great way for us to do that. And we do it, I think, in a very, I think we're very effective at what we do, and it's largely because we, we are aware of our audiences and follow a couple of standards. Um, so if you don't follow Interior yet on social media, please check us out. We have an active Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. We're also on other platforms, but this is where you'll see a lot of the beauty and the humor that we are talking about today. So I think one thing that's kind of fascinating about communicating on behalf of government is it becomes very quick and easy to dive into a world of acronyms, to dive into complexity. And so I love this quote from Aristotle. I actually played with the idea of like decorating it. And I was like, you know what? It's kind of funny just to put the quote up there, but it really is simplicity that makes the uneducated more effective sometimes at talking about our own missions. And um, so it is, it is one of these things that we always, when we're closer to an issue, it's much more difficult to describe it simply. And I think that's something that we all kind of face. You know, when I'm talking about interior, to me, there are so many layers involved with our mission that it becomes incredibly difficult for me to say, but what we put on social media is just pretty landscapes. But that has been a large part of kind of what we're trying to do is simplify what interior is so that we can communicate the essence of it. Um, so just thinking about that and, and thinking about that quote as, as we talk about, you know, what, the different social strategies. So the way that the kind of approach we take and, and this goes down to just how we approach community, how we all are doing it 
um, the similarities I see are we all listen and identify the needs of the community and then we'll create content around what we identify. So, um, and that can show up in many different ways. And then we engage with them, kind of receive that feedback, measure our efforts and the cycle begins again. So it really allows us, social media is not just a publishing platform to most of our channels. Um, and that's something that I'm very passionate about. It is a way to listen. And it's something that if you're not using social media to listen, then please don't try humor. Please don't, <laughs> please don't just, if, if you're not using social media to really connect with people and to build community, um, you know, you're, you're kind of missing out on a huge part of this. So, um, so the way Interior kind of works is we, we do a lot of different listening and at least on our, on our national channels, you know, we'll look at different hashtags, keywords, whether it's of, you know, our, our current secretary or, um, but we do always follow U.S. Interior. And so we're, we're looking for community photos. We're looking to kind of enrich um, the entire conversation around our mission. And largely the monitoring is where I learn a lot about what people want and kind of where their, their focus is and where there's an opportunity for us. And so um, a, huge, a huge thing that I always focus on is the audience. You know, I'm not trying to bore them. I'm not trying to interrupt them. I do like to mix up our content so that it's not just fluff constantly. And, um, and that is something that it's a little bit more of an art than I think people realize. Um, but we're very audience focused. We're not trying to um, just barrage them with our own press releases. We're really trying to work in what we, what we see that they want. Um, and at, at Interior, you know, on our channels, we focus a lot with the travel community. We're really looking at a lot of um, the, ma the lands we manage. And that's, that's a tactic because at the time, you know, several years ago when we began social media, there was a real need to talk about public lands. And I think there was an, a misunderstanding that public lands were these like, you know, brown signs that you could just skip by. And certainly people love national parks, but there, there's so much out there. And so we really work to inspire wonderless in the sense of FOMO, essentially, when you look through our social media platforms. We want to remind people of memories that they've had in these places or if they grew up there. And we, and we do want to share information that goes beyond just public lands, but, but our mission in general. So that's just a quick overview. Um, we focus primarily on beauty. We do throw in a bunch of dad jokes, but I'm going to hand it over to these humor gurus um, and, and we'll go from there. Hi. Uh, <laughs> so as I mentioned earlier, my name is Holly Richards. Uh, I work for External Affairs for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I'm based out of Honolulu. Uh, and my job really um, is to help share the incredible mission of what the Fish and Wildlife Service does using digital platforms. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is, um, I think, probably the coolest agency that you might never have heard of uh, because we do a lot of things. Uh, we have an incredibly broad mission. Uh, we are responsible for uh, protecting endangered species. That's, that's our bag. We manage migratory birds and wetlands. We work to restore fisheries across the country. Uh, we're responsible for conserving and restoring wildlife habitat uh, across the country. Uh, we combat wildlife trafficking internationally, uh, and we manage the National Wildlife Refuge System. Um, so we have a lot of different things that we're responsible for, but one thing that cuts across all of them is this connection to wildlife. Um, because we have such a diverse mission, that also means that we're trying to speak to a lot of different groups, right? So we speak to rural hunters and anglers who use our refuges um, for hunting and fishing and, and traditional uses. Uh, there's urban birders and conservationists. There's endangered species biologists um, and conservationists, private landowners who are in need of permits, companies that are in need of permits. We have to speak to a lot of very what sometimes appear to be divergent constituencies. Um, and one of the things that um, has worked for us and has been a, a primary strategy is that on our, our social media platforms, um, we, we find the thing that cuts across all of those groups and it's a love of beauty, humor, and wildlife. Um, what does um, a, a birder in Atlanta have, with, have in common with a, a rural hunter in Wyoming? They probably love wildlife and wild places, these wild landscapes. Um, and so that's, that's one of the things that we try to focus on as we're, um, as we're speaking to these groups. Um, so we can 
advance that slide, thank you. Uh, so how do we do that then? Because uh, there's a lot of different ways that you could do that. So our focus so far um, um, has been um, kind of a, a playful uh, approach. Um, one of the things that I'm sure everyone has noticed if you're on these sort of um, social spaces very much is that they've become incredibly curated spaces. And I think people have started to feel a bit of a per perfection fatigue when they're on Instagram or they're on like the barrage of Twitter. So we try to find things that sort of cut through that perfection fatigue. Um, so we focus on beautiful spaces and inspiring and majestic wildlife, but we always try to find that little slant. Um, and I like to think of it as like wildlife, but a little bit weird, right? So what is a way that we can frame this, um, this incredible space or this really cool species in a way that's relatable, um, that we um, can feel and relate to, um, that doesn't feel like this super perfect space, right? And because I think we, we want those super perfect spaces, but also sometimes they start to just wash over us. So in order to sort of stand out from that crowd, we try to find that little, that little odd slant. Um, we try to encourage space for play. Um, so that's a really important part of, of how we frame our social media. And then we encourage delight. So we wanna, we wanna position ourselves with our audience um, as falling in love with and being delighted by these species along with them, right? And we try to make sure that that comes through with how we're speaking about these species. Um, uh, so, and I think uh, we do a really good job on that. We really do, a, I think, a really good job on that on our, our Instagram account um, of really just uh, playing with folks and, and um, um, playing with, with all the different ways that we can enjoy wildlife. So that's kind of how we frame our overall approach. And then if we get kind of specific on that, um, we try to really use humor in that space. And I think that kind of goes without question. Um, humor is without question what uh, really drives our engagement. It's the most popular posts that we do are not the most perfect, incredible, majestic species. It's where we get a little bit weird and funny, right? This is one of my favorite recent posts that we've done. Um, it's, it's an odd mashup of uh, an owl and an otter, I think, um, and it, it's asking people to ID the the question, and it's it's a it's a sort of play on the the social media trend of wrong answers only. So if you've been on Twitter much or Instagram, it's sort of a, a running joke on those platforms that you know you you throw something at your audience when you ask them to give you wrong answers only, and it's just a way to encourage playful delight. But this was a, a way that we took our own slant on that. So it's really important that you sort of pay attention to these platforms and listen to the running jokes, listen to the types of humor, the types of conversations that are happening, but then find ways to apply that specifically to your brand or to your audience. So for us, this was how we took sort of a, a larger conversation, a larger joke that was cutting across these different platforms and we applied it to our specific, um, our brand, which is sort of like weird wildlife. And this, so this worked on all those different levels. You, you notice it, it's kind of odd. It's it draws you in because you don't know what's happening and then you've got this space to kind of play and the comments really took off and there was a lot of people talking back and forth and so it just became this really great spot um, for for engagement with people for building a community around a love of wildlife and also just some some lighthearted humor um, within this space and so we've really tried really hard to to create that space with our audience um, we also really try to focus on um, engaging uh, people to send us stuff, right? And so some of the things that we've done that have been really um, effective, and again, this has been mostly on our, our Instagram account, has been um, uh, asking people to, to play with things like drawing, right? So we'll post up a, a drawing prompt or um, we'll ask people to tag us in different games that we're doing. And of course, everyone is doing this right now. This is really common, especially during the pandemic. COVID pandemic, everyone's sort of looking for ways to have fun and playfulness. And so this has been really effective for us. People love to see, um, people love to see big accounts engaging with them. They love to see and share their own artwork or their own thoughts or their own poetry, um, asking them to share their favorite wildlife books. We wanna ask them to engage with us and then we share that back. And one of the biggest ways that, it's a really simple way is just even commenting back on those, on their answers and then sharing them back. Um, out on our account. Um, but again, with the really important part of this is, is finding ways to, to apply that to your specific brand. So for us, it's all about wildlife. It's about using these prompts to introduce them to maybe species they've never heard of, 
or places they've never heard of. So we'll have, say, the strawberry hermit crab uh, was a drawing prompt, and also some of our Hawaiian forest birds were drawing prompts. And then we use that to sort of introduce them to these species that they might never see in, in real life, or maybe if they come out to Hawaii, they can see them. But it's a space to engage in that sort of play around these, these cool species. Um, and then I think the, the final thing that we like to think of when we're looking at how we, how we build this community, this audience, you know, we want to engage in play, we try to keep it lighthearted and weird, but we want to meet their needs. And I think this is one that's easy to forget, right? Um, especially in, in government agencies, it's really important for us. We have things that we need to tell our audiences. We have legislation and regulatory issues and stuff we want to tell people about, right? Um, but one of the things that I think is most important is remembering that um, we also need to be providing a service, right? We are the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So how can we be of service to our audience as well that's still in keeping with our brand? I think this uh, post here was actually from our Facebook post, our, our Facebook account. And I think it's a really great example of thinking about our audience first and how we can uniquely meet their needs. And it was just a really simple idea. Hey, do you have a cool wildlife photo? You don't know what it is. And I like who doesn't have photos from a vacation or a trip or a walk in the park where you see something, you're like, I don't know what this is. You snap a picture and then maybe you forget about it or you try to find out what it is and it just sort of languishes on your phone. We all have those images. And this was a space to be like, hey, you got one of those? We're the wildlife agency, send them to us. We'll help you ID them. It really took off. And it was just such a simple way to think about what our audience might be needing from us and who they need us to be and meeting that need in a way that built community and built trust and built a relationship with the people that we're interacting with. And I think what Daniel said was really important, and I know that what Matt's about to talk is the same way, is that it's so, so important when you're engaging in these spaces, that you remember that these are real people on the other side of the screen. You wanna meet their needs, you wanna engage with them um, as humans and remember to speak to them as humans and respond to them. And all of those things that make for a good relationship in person are what we can bring to our social media as we're building communities, right? Meeting needs, listening to people, relating to them, being responsive, engaging in, in play, sharing ideas. These are the things that we try to do on our social spaces and then do it around our brand, which is uh, the people that care for wildlife. And that's what is uniting all of those folks that we're talking with online, is this desire to care for and care for our special species and these special places. Um, and we can do that together. So like fish and wildlife, uh, you know, the National Park Service has amazing resources to highlight and share and really an audience that is really, you know, interested in our mission and wants to connect with us. And, you know, um, through social media, you know, we're able to connect and engage with a global audience really like never before and showcase, you know, natural and cultural parks, uh, commemorations, uh, important events, uh, share travel tips and, you know, hopefully inspire and, you know, entertain along the way. And uh, with social media, you know, our challenge is certainly kind of holding a fine line, though, because we're, we're educating and engaging people as we welcome them to these places. Uh, we want to lead by example while still continuing to showcase kind of the best of what, you know, the parks have to offer. And at the same time, you know, encouraging visitors to respect park resources, you know, practice leave no trace, uh, follow rules and regulations, you know, stay alive, all the basics uh, when visiting a park. Um, so again, you know, we want to reach new audiences uh, and inspire existing ones. Um, we really want to build an even stronger community of, of park supporters and advocates. And you know, the National Park Service, it has a long, rich history. We manage uh, iconic places, and we know that there's already kind of a built-in audience of, of park lovers, but we also want to engage, you know, all generations and continue to, to showcase all that the service preserves and interprets. And, um, you know, we also want to promote a, a deeper understanding about the variety of national park sites um, through accurate, uh, engaging, uh, and really timely content. You know, a lot of people kind of get hung up on the, the 62 national parks. And, you know, we all love Yellowstone and the Grand Canyon, but we also want to highlight, you know, stories from, you know, Salem Maritime or, you know, the recreational opportunities and, and big cat studies at Santa Monica Mountains. So we're constantly working to showcase the 400 plus parks that are managed by the National Park Service, um, as well as the hundreds of programs, partnerships, affiliated areas, and so forth, that, you know, and really keep the, 
the public engaged and invested uh, in these special places. And at the same time, you know, we're doing this by sharing out uh, park updates, news, policy, all that important stuff, you know, providing resources to learn more, uh, really directing people back to our website. And kind of the biggest thing too, just being a platform that the public really can interact with us and with each other. So we can go to our next slide, please. Thank you. So for us, it is all about kind of engaging the audience and, you know, interaction is key. And again, we're, we're very fortunate to have, you know, a ton of great content to share. Uh, but we found a lot of positive growth and engagement by packaging that content uh, with some personality, with some humor, you know, trying to make connections with the world around us. And, you know, that might be unexpected for a government agency uh, for many people. Um, one example is kind of our uh, safety with a smile campaign or kind of theme, a kind of a combination of a policy and uh, safety messages, guidelines, kind of folded in with something more entertaining and, and uh, kind of a more lighthearted way. And if we can go to our next slide, actually. Some examples there. So example here is our, our wildlife uh, petting chart. Um, you know, every year people like to test the boundaries of their own survival and try to interact a bit too closely with wildlife. Uh, we pushed this out last summer after kind of a string of wildlife and encounters, mainly bison encounters in parks, just as another way of kind of saying the same thing that is already posted on websites, on signage and visitor centers and brochures uh, about respecting wildlife and kind of staying a proper safe distance away. And, you know, packaging that message in a more, you know, lighthearted way. Uh, the petting chart, you know, basically shows there is no place, uh, safe place to pet a wild animal. You know, and this had massive engagement, was picked up by a lot of major news organizations who themselves are maybe a bit surprised that the Park Service would take this kind of tone, but uh, they also jumped on it and shared it widely. And in the end, you know, it became a, another way to, you know, kind of push out a message that we continue to push out, but in a different tone, it may have reached more eyes, uh, different audiences, and it really got people to think twice, you know, before messing with wildlife. Uh, and we'll see, you know, we'll probably be dusting this one off again uh, uh, later this summer. But some other examples there too, uh, just some engagement, uh, um, you know, to kind of latch on to, to what's trending to, uh, um, you know, the Dolly Parton Challenge was really popular a while back. So uh, we did the Park Service uh, take on that. So if we can kind of connect to, uh, these trends in a, in a, you know, a positive way, we'll definitely look to uh, kind of put ourselves out there. Our next slide, please. Um, along with that safety with a smile, we also do a lot of uh, kind of edutainment, so that educate and entertain kind of combination. And, you know, we often combine more straightforward facts and content, and again, packaging kind of more that entertaining, uh, lighthearted way. And these posts do tend to have uh, the most engagement and you know, we're trying to make these posts, uh, you know, shareable content uh, that can really appeal to a, a wider audience and hopefully, you know, reach uh, a greater audience. And I'd like to think, you know, we kind of set up shop at the intersection of, of nature, of pop culture and humor. Uh, sometimes it's lonely there, but for the most part, you know, uh, the general public is willing to come with us on that journey. And, you know, they get the reference, they get the pun, the subtle nod, and they really can kind of appreciate the post. And, you know, certainly as a, a government agency uh, and a proud, you know, 100 plus year old organization, we do still walk that fine line, though. You know, we don't want to be funny just to be funny, but really use it as a means of, you know, sharing and engaging. And, you know, we're certainly conscious of what we do share, uh, what we're pulling from, what we're referencing, and always aim to be kind of respectful of the content and the resources. And um, especially now, you know, with the current situation, you know, we still infuse humor and some personality, some more lighthearted content into our messaging uh, while still striving to be, you know, sincere and aware of, you know, the world uh, around us. And, you know, the humor and the, the lighthearted posts that we do use in a way are meant kind of as an escape, as something positive for visitors to really connect with, even in trying times or, you know, in the current situation where people can't physically get to a park as easily, uh, but they can still, you know, visit virtually, uh, see these amazing places, and hopefully, you know, they're planning their trips uh, you know, for a future visit. But again, uh, just a few more examples in there, of, you know, educating and entertaining or that kind of edutainment. Um, again, animals are always popular, um, uh, like fish and wildlife. So we create those interactive posts that encourage people to, you know, draw, say, their own bison from memory, uh, show some of their colorings. Uh, uh, we try to put safety messaging in almost every post. Uh, so even using some of the vintage photos, you know, fashion may have changed, but visitor behavior you know, it still has a long way to go there. Um, so we definitely 
try to show some variety in the type of post. Again, creating shareable content, uh, doing our part to help the slower friends when hiking and uh, avoid becoming bear bait. So uh, definitely a mix of all kinds of uh, uh, different references and, and humor kind of thrown in there. Um, but again, you know, this mix of humor, um, subtle references, uh, a lot of it is used kind of as that hook at the beginning of a post. Uh, hopefully grab people's in uh, and maybe they'll read the entire post all the way to the end. And along the way, uh, you know, actually learn an educational tidbit, a fun fact, a, a safety message, and, you know, thanks to that uh, maybe surprising hook at the beginning, um, they're able to, you know, learn more about uh, a park or an event or, you know, have a, a stronger connection there. Um, so again, you know, feel free to follow the National Park Service. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you have questions, I want to know more about how we do manage or create materials and content, you're always, you know, feel free to reach out. Uh, I'll turn it back to Danielle there. Thank you, Matt and Holly. I, I feel like one thing that we, we all kind of have in sharing is um, when you get people last, laughing, you get them listening. And I think that that's something that you guys have really kind of figured out for your audiences and uh, you just do a fantastic job. So both uh, all the teams involved and all the, all, the, um, all the work that's done on social for, for you guys is so fantastic. And what I what I love about kind of our social media community because it's you know it's broader it's all those agencies that we listed on the first page. Um, I love it when we can work together and when we can kind of lift each other up. And so um, I use this example because Fat Bear Week was a fun thing that Cat My National Park and Preserve was doing just on its own for a while, and then Park Service was lifting it up, and we were lifting it up, and. Um, we just, we get to work together on some of these things that are quite fun and informative. And I think that edutainment mindset is something that's so important because when we're having a good time on social and we're also learning together, it's just a more enjoyable place to be. And I, I see government in a wonderful way. We have a luxury often to, to just be there for education, for enjoyment. You know, we're not trying to fundraise. We're not trying to do certain things. So there's a real, um, interesting place there that we can explore together and it definitely needs to be mindful of the times and that's when it comes back to listening i think that's a huge piece of it um so yeah we got to work together on fat bear week and i think that was um a really great example of how we took that content and we expounded on it so that it was even more informational and that's kind of what we're always trying to do is kind of build out you know once we've hooked people in with humor how do we kind of provide them with good content. One thing to know is, you know, while great humor and um, beauty are, are wonderful ways to connect to community, it's always great to double check things with other people and finding those sources of people who are going to give you honest feedback around your posts. It's very crucial. I can tell you, um, you know, it's, it's one of these things where sometimes sarcasm doesn't fall well, or sometimes the, the tone just comes off um, not as much as not in the way you'd want it to. Um, and so it's always great to have another person to check in. And, you know, regardless of what you're doing, it just helps to have people you can benchmark and kind of check your work with. Um, so before you post, check it with somebody else. After you post, be ready to engage because like these guys have said, the engagement's really the gold. Um, and unfortunately, it feels like that's always the first thing that goes even, you know, in my own work commenting back on other comments, I think is an art form in and of itself. And it's something that I would love to, you know, um, to kind of spend more time doing, but having that active commenting policy is a great helpful thing to have. And I think most of our agents, most government agencies have one. Um, and yeah, just knowing when to get more involved and really gaining the wisdom from your community. You know, I, I cannot stress enough how frequently we will learn about new trends or um, or just issues that people have or questions they have just through um, through our community. So, and with that, I'm just gonna let my dog bark it out. Perfect. All right. Well, I am officially here. I'm James and Roberts. I'm the uh, branch chief for the promotions branch within the Center for New Media and Promotion at the U.S. Census Bureau. And I'm here to talk with you guys about the 2020 census. All right, so 
I'll introduce you guys to my team, some of which are on the call. I'm James, I am the branch chief. Uh, Yolanda Bird is the deputy chief in the branch, along with Amaya Alston, Anthony Richards, Peggy Williams, and Kyle Malloy, and Isaac Adams. And we make up the Census Bureau social media team. So let's dive into the 2020 census campaign and talk about some of the highlights, I bet, talk about some of the highlights that we've done so far in this campaign. There's a lot going on still, so in the future, we would love to come back and talk about the campaign in depth. So we'll start off with the creation of a social media hub on 2020census.gov for aggregation of shareable content, including the 2020 census pledge. And the pledge is for people to pledge to complete the census and to let their neighbors, friends, and families also know about the 2020 census so everyone is counted in the country. We also established the Census Bureau's first 24-7 customer care strategy. We provide assistance through social care on our social media channels in English and in Spanish. Right now, it is 24-7. We also developed the first chatbot for the agency. We've had multiple phases for this chatbot, and currently we have a chatbot built for Facebook Messenger, and we have one built for Twitter. The chatbot will answer routine FAQs, provide census customer support, and answer other topics that are programmed into the chatbot. We've also developed an extensive social listening program to help guide campaign operations and decisions, combat rumors and misinformation, and to optimize content creation for owned and paid social media. All right. We've also produced hundreds, and I mean hundreds, of evergreen and timely assets for the different campaign phases to support paid and owned social media strategies. We've executed 17 social media events for the 2020 Census campaign, produced 23 Instagram stories for the 2020 Census campaign. We're also working with a multitude of social media influencers and the biggest part is we're running one of the largest advertising agencies, one of the largest advertising campaigns across our multiple social media channels, including Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, and Twitter. So if you've seen our ads, put a lot of hard work into that. How everyone can help us spread the word. Tell others to respond to the 2020 census. Through your social media channels, you can help shape your community. Follow our channels and share our content. You can also visit our social media hub and our partner page for 2020 census resources. The two um, URLs are right here. And don't forget our hashtag is hashtag 2020 census. And that is a brief overview of our campaign. Okay, so we're on to our last 15 minutes. Uh, I'm going to tag in Layla and Carolina from the uh, Department of State's Foreign Service Institute. They're going to be talking really quickly on finding an appropriate tone in, on social media in a crisis. Hello, everyone. Wait a second while that comes up. Okay, great. So I'm Layla Kamgar, and I will be joined by my colleague, Caroline Agston, about halfway through. Uh, we'll do a switch over for the presentation. Um, we're from the Office of Public Affairs at the Department of State's Foreign Service Institute, and we'll be talking about tuning your tone during a crisis and how you can completely rework your uh, content calendar. So as part of this presentation, I'll talk about what the Foreign Service Institute is uh, as, as by way of background. Um, what we would normally be doing on social media and our communications during the COVID-19 pandemic. So for all intents and purposes, FSI is the US Diplomatic Academy. So our mission is to deliver world-class diplomatic training and provide the career long learning that US government foreign affairs professionals need in today's global arena. So um, under normal circumstances, we have a physical presence with two campuses um, in Northern Virginia, where we host between 1,500 and 2,500 students on a daily basis and have about 1,400 staff. So it's a quite large bureau and um, quite large daily volume. 
In addition to that, we support about 225,000 digital enrollments per year. And we have uh, regional training uh, by sending people out to travel. Uh, so instructors who will go out into the field to travel uh, at our different missions around the world, as well as using uh, regional adjunct faculty. So uh, faculty who are based um, uh, and embedded in different missions around the world. Um, in terms of platforms that we have, we have a Twitter account, a LinkedIn page, and we manage the state.gov portion of um, the, the website that is related to the Foreign Service Institute. Uh, in terms of target audiences, uh, we uh, are looking with this as well as our broader public affairs strategy to engage with people who interact with FSL. So that can be our customers or potential customers, so our students. Um, uh, and as well as stakeholders, that could be, you know, Congress, it could be press, it could be um, others who could be potentially coming as speakers to the class, uh, the broader foreign affairs community, um, think tanks, academia, um, and it could also be um, those that we would be looking to benchmark with. So whether that's uh, other international diplomatic academies, um, uh, others in the professional learning and training community, et cetera. So these are a couple examples of what our, our social would normally look like. So some of it would be spotlights on our training. So this is an example of when um, we had some of our trainers go out to our embassy in Zagreb to uh, facilitate a crisis management training exercise. We also would highlight uh, some of our VIP visitors who are coming uh, to our campus in person. So for example, when we had a congressman come. And a large scale programs and events. Um, so this is this is an example of a post related to our orientation training, and um, this is a, a a major activity there where when they get their flags, uh, when they find out where they're going for their first assignment overseas as a foreign service officer or specialist, they get a flag, and so so that that's what that's representing. So as you can see, a lot of those events are basically in person or human contact, travel related, etc. So. Um, those would be something that wouldn't be fitting so well under uh, under COVID circumstances. So um, as the coronavirus spread overseas, uh, we start to saw we started to see an effect on our target audiences um, and what they cared about. And so as of late February, we made a concerted effort to start assessing and tracking and monitoring um, what was happening with our audiences. So um, both from the different stakeholders and that we followed. Um, so how are they reacting um, to uh, the spread of the virus? Um, what were they saying? How are they using their own accounts to talk about this? And how are they calibrating their message? Um, and then monitoring um, the activity that was happening on our pages. And if we can just go ahead one slide. So here's an example of um, monitoring our audiences. So as early as late February, we were seeing some comments, for example, on our LinkedIn page about this, we had a post on collaborative learning, um, and even on that, something that was a you know seemingly unrelated topic. We had someone talk about how it was especially important to have that foundation during when there were global issues happening like COVID. Um, and later, we were getting even more pointed questions about how we were protecting our diplomats and family members overseas as travel bans were happening, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously, this was a sensitive topic, and as as things were evolving with the crisis, um, we had to kind of make sure that we were paying attention to, to how that was changing um, in very real time. At the same time, we were uh, changing our, our own content because um, as we were getting into March, um, we basically didn't have uh, uh, any more in-person events. We were starting to postpone or cancel those as well as CDC guidelines were evolving. Um, and by mid-March, we were transitioning ourselves to a telework and remote learning um, scenario. Um, and so this was a time where we stepped back and we reflected on, okay, so the, the content that we had on our calendar uh, is not going to happen. Um, so what do we do? Um, we are not necessarily the health experts and there, there, there are others that are the lead for that. Um, does it make sense to just retreat what they're doing um, or is there some other path? Um, and what we decided to do is to reflect on how we could contribute based on what we were hearing that our audiences needed. So this was a moment when we had a large shift and transition of our, our customer base and as well as all of our stakeholders. Um, 
and there was a lot of anxiety uh, related to going to remote learning, remote training, telework, um, as well as just what was happening at that time in the world. Um, and, uh, and so we also reflected on, okay, so what do people look to FSI for um, and where are our areas of expertise? So rather than trying to fit into some mold that we didn't fit into, where could we add value? And so um, it just so happens that one of the areas that we provide training in is resilience, for example. And so related to that, we decided, okay, well, let's start with that. We have these experts on resilience. So let's talk to them about how we can collaborate and um, do content that is going to be useful in this moment. And um, I will turn it over to my colleague, Caroline, to talk about how we did that. And then from there, we um, sort of built on that to build out other pieces of content that would be true to the voice um, in this moment of in line with our FSI brand um, and our mission, and, um, but also playing to our areas of expertise. Over to you. All right. Thank you, Layla. So as she mentioned, um, the first phase of our um, you know, restarting the posting was all about resilience. And so we're calling this our resilience phase. Um, so we tapped into our experts, A, to see if they had content already readily available that we could help quickly package and disseminate on, so on social. We also worked with them to create new content for the moment specific um, about the telework situation um, or about um, you know, COVID-19 and what was going on in the world. So here's just an example um, of a GIF that we did with the director of the resilience program. Um, and so we helped repackage and reformat a lot of um, content this way. And so I'll go through a couple of different examples. So this countdown um, about how to take care of yourself every day by simple resilience practices, this got a lot of attention. It was retweeted by the State Department spokesperson and a number of embassies. Um, so we realized that the resilience resources that often had um, concrete steps were the ones that performed better. Um, and so again, this content is consistent with our previous messaging about showcasing FSI as a world-class diplomatic training center, um, but it's also showing awareness and attention to the current crisis, right? So we weren't ignoring that this crisis was going on, um, but instead we were trying to match up FSI's expertise to our audience needs. In addition to Twitter, um, we were also posting on LinkedIn. So this is an example, um, again, from the director of the resilience program about keeping a, a gratitude journal. Um, so this performed very well. Again, it was a concrete and tangible idea about how to um, exercise resilience during this period. So throughout all of this, um, as we began posting, we were gauging audience reactions. So we were looking specifically at um, engagement rates, you know, retweeting, sharing, and specifically comments. So this is, these are a couple of examples from the post that I just shared about the gratitude journal. You know, so we can see here, people are saying, um, you know, thanks for posting. This info comes just in time. Thank you, FSI. Um, so this was really helpful to see that we were hitting our mark in the way that we thought we were. And for all of these posts, um, we were driving people back to our main page on state.gov. So this is where we host some of the longer form articles that the resilience trainers have written specific for the COVID-19 moment and how to exercise resilience. Um, this gets a lot of traffic as it's filed under the main Department of State's COVID-19 resource page. Um, so we get a lot of traffic on this page. And so once we realized that we were getting a lot of really positive feedback, we took our content ideas to the next level with this campaign called FSI at Home. And so just by the name, um, you know, we're recognizing that this isn't, um, you know, we're not continuing as normal. Um, you know, practically our entire bureau has moved to virtual work. Um, so when thinking about this campaign, we wanted to understand how FSI could uniquely contribute to people's lives during this period. Um, again, how is FSI going to be useful during this crisis, um, which uh, Layla has discussed. So in addition to our resilience experts, we wanted to tap into other areas of expertise across the Bureau. So matching up um, our various experts with um, audience needs. Um, so again, as the Foreign Affairs uh, Diplomatic Training Academy, we were hoping to be that new outlet for people to learn something. So whether um, you're home alone and looking for something to do, or whether you have kids and you're trying to help fill up their time with activities. So these were some of the things that we were hearing from our main audiences at our bureau, as well as um, more broadly into the community.
So I'll go through a couple of examples of what this looks like. So this um, is a short 60 second um, video, or I guess um, two minute video from our um, a Khmer language and Cambodian, and Cambodian culture instructor. Um, so she's just introducing Khmer greetings. So again, we're not necessarily mentioning COVID-19 in all of our content. Um, we're in, instead taking into consideration our tone and our captions. Um, here's another example. Um, for this one, we tapped into the expertise of um, FSIs and the State Department's diplomatic historians. So they went back into their archives. They dug up correspondence from their research that shows how past uh, how past um, infectious diseases have affected the conduct of diplomacy over time. Um, so we published these recently to tap into World Malaria Day and World Immunization Week. And again, we're also showing how our trainers are getting creative with their remote trainings. So these are a couple of additional examples um, of pieces that we have in train or are working on. Um, so again, we're really trying to farm out um, to experts across the entire Bureau. So we're tapping into the leadership and management school at FSI to discuss the importance of leadership during a crisis. Um, we have tutorials coming from our IT trainers on ways to um, conduct remote learning um, and remote training sessions. And again, resilience, historical um, tidbits and language instructor videos. And so now I will turn it back over to my colleague Layla as we go over some takeaways um, and actionable steps that maybe you could do at your agency or your bureau. Thanks, Caroline. So um, first off, I think reflecting on what's worked so far and what we continue to do is um, really giving yourself a little bit of time to um, reflect on the change that's happening and to be able to brainstorm about how you're matching um, your brand, your voice, your overall objectives. Um, and you know what people come to you for uh, with what you can put out um, as as the situation is fluidly evolving. Um, and so in this case, we we said, okay, um, if these are the needs that we're hearing, um, what kind of areas of expertise do we have, and who can we reach out to internally to potentially collaborate to to deliver on content pieces that would that would um, achieve those needs. And so we have a whole master list and, you know, we're not even halfway through um, when it comes to, to uh, reaching out to those folks about those different types of things that Caroline mentioned from everyone from our office of the historian to our resilience trainers, our, um, our uh, language experts, IT trainers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it really started with this big brainstorm about, okay, if these are the needs that we're hearing from people, um, and from the audiences based on that listening and monitoring exercise internally and through social, um, then, then, you know, here's the whole brainstorm and then let's have follow up conversations about what's actually realistic and, and what we could potentially do and, and, and make into action. Um, and then secondly, uh, it's really crucial to have buy-in from your bureau leadership and um, as necessary, higher up leadership as well. Um, and in, in this case, we were lucky to have both. Um, although I will say that that didn't necessarily come automatically. It wasn't an initial pitch and a done sort of thing. Um, one thing that did work well for us was the fact that we were continuously briefing our leadership on what we were hearing from doing these listening exercises. So um, we, in all of our meetings with them, were sharing social trends that we were seeing, um, uh, feedback on comments that we were getting, um, uh, what we were seeing in the press as well. Um, and then we were also sharing um, uh, kind of two ways as I was sitting in on um, meetings with our senior staff, I was sharing back with the rest of the Office of Public Affairs um, what, what they were sharing about internally what the rest of the, um, what the rest of the Bureau was hearing and from, from those conversations what the rest of the department was, was saying and, and what people were going through to make sure that across different layers we were really linked up um, so that our as we were coming together with our brainstorms and our suggestions that those could be really well informed. And so as that was happening, our leadership then got to a certain point where they said, okay, so we're hearing all this, this being briefed from you. What do you suggest that we do as our plan of action? And because we'd done that brainstorm, we were ready to present it to them. They liked the plan and then they were willing to then, you know, send that out to the rest of the bureau um, to, to get others, including uh, like other senior leadership to help us to, to make the push for that content and to um, you know, do that gentle nudge to others to, to um, get things going. That was very helpful. 
Um, and, and then beyond that, um, I think, uh, is tapping into connections across the bureau and the organization that you already have. So, um, you know, we definitely played into connections that we had um, uh, within our own bureau uh, in terms of like innovative collaborators that we've worked with in the past um, on a different topic. To go back to them to say, hey, you sort of get things when it comes to a public affairs, social media context. Um, what about this idea and kind of pitching it? And so they have been really helpful in, um, for example, one of our IT collaborators has kind of helped to gather others when it comes to um, creating like a suite of content um, that we're hoping to, to push out about um, how you would use different types of technology tools um, when you're working um, or training remotely. Um, so, I think those sorts of things are really helpful as well as um, tapping into to what you have across the organization um, and, and what, what is established there and what you can help to grow through utilizing these um, unique moments. And I'll turn it back over to Caroline to talk about some of the, the tools that we've used since uh, there's some challenges that, that come with creating content during this particular time as well. Sure. So, as you saw from the first half of the presentation, some of those examples, obviously, before we were, were relying on photo and video um, to pair along with our content. Obviously, now we are, that's impossible for us to do. So, we've had to get creative um, with using new types of web based tools. So, I like to use easel, um, which is sort of like Canva. Um, so, I've used that to create lots of GIFs and other types of graphics. Wave.video is also really nice for video editing. Um, it allows you to put in stickers and captions and lots of fun and engaging things. Um, and then also Camtasia for screen recording has been very helpful. Um, so again, this is sort of just, you know, trying to transition and adapt to the current moment and not being able to take photo or video in person. And then of course, throughout all of this, um, you know, as the final step, we've been analyzing what works to make sure that we're filling that niche and filling that void as we think we are and that we hope we are. Um, so, just a couple of quick stats um, for LinkedIn, our paid views have been up by 26% for this FSI at home period um, as compared to the previous 30 or 35 days. Um, we've had 18% more unique visitors um, and 40% more button clicks. And for Twitter, we've also had um, an exponential growth in um, comments um, and replies to us um, as well as increased followers within the past 30 days. So that wraps up our presentation. Um, you can find our contact information on the slide, um, as well as our social channels and how to find us on state.gov. Um, please follow us if you're interested in you know, seeing the type of content that we're putting out.